people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's schedule is packed with a flurry of visits and meetings with major global players. G7, Indo-Pacific Island Cooperation Summit, PM Modi will be one of the most influential leaders at all of these gatherings. The world's newfound admiration for India stems from her ascent to diplomatic and economic dominance. It has become evidently clear of late that it is neither feasible nor realistic to seek a meaningful progress in geopolitics without the largest country of the world, India's engagement. Join us as we discuss Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's upcoming visits and how they will further strengthen India's significant standing in a swift evolving global hierarchy. With diverse political settings and objectives, Japan, Australia and Papua New Guinea have invited Prime Minister Narendra Modi the G7 summit has acknowledged India's growing dominance at the global stage and has sent her an invitation to every single summit since 2019. The Quad, as a security grouping, loses its significance without India, and India's outreach to island nations has been rewarded as she is set to chair the Indo-Pacific Cooperation Summit on May 22nd. India has emerged as a major force in global diplomacy, a leader in multilateralism, Apart from her successful engagements with her close allies and neighbors, India is leading several prominent regional and global groupings, such as the G20 and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India has seized the leadership position in upholding the principle of international cooperation to ensure global peace, security, and sustainability. India has its own standing and its own recogni uh, recognition at the international level. It's a power to reckon with. So therefore, all the power blocks and all the important countries of the West, they are very much tempted to extend their deep bilateral relationship as well as a multilateral relationship. New Delhi not only holds close connections with its allies, but its multi-alignment strategy ensures positive relations with nations world over. India is currently the president of the SCO and the G20, two groups which experts believe can contribute significantly to global stability and security. While economies throughout the world are still recovering from COVID fallouts, the Russia-Ukraine war has also added to economic and security challenges, which India and her allies are handling conscientiously. India recently hosted foreign ministers of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization nations in Goa to discuss regional security matters, including adding Iran and Belarus to a union of nations, which are seen as a counterweight to Western influence in Eurasia. It is the world's largest regional body in terms of geographic scope and population. The SCO largely focuses on regional security issues and the fight against regional terrorism, ethnic separatism, and religious extremism. The world is today facing a multitude of challenges. These events have disrupted global supply chains, leading to serious impact on the supply of energy, food, and fertilizers, and cascading effects on developing nations. These challenges, however, are also an opportunity for member states of the SCO to collaborate and address them collectively. India's chief concerns also remain regional security and improving better ties with its neighbors, including China and Pakistan. Unfortunately, India continues to face border conflicts with both China and Pakistan over terrorism and drug trafficking. The Foreign Minister of Pakistan, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, who took part at the SCO meet, 
was the first senior leader from Pakistan to visit India in almost 12 years. His visit, however, failed to break the ice and no bilateral meeting took place with his Indian counterpart. Indian Foreign Minister Jai Shankar came down heavily on Pakistan as he called his counterpart Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, a spokesperson of a terrorism industry. As a foreign minister of an SCO member state, uh, Mr. Bhutto Zardari was treated accordingly. As a promoter, justifier, uh, and I'm sorry to say spokesperson of a terrorism industry, which is the mainstay of Pakistan, his positions were called out and they were countered, including at the SEO meeting itself. As part of its G20 presidency this year, India continues to engage with global leaders and diplomats under the theme, One Earth, One Family, One Future. G20 events being hosted in different cities is helping delegates and guests to catch a glimpse of India's rich culture and tradition in terms of food delicacy and diversity in language and cultural heritage. At least 200 events have been planned in over 50 cities across the country on scores of work streams. India has a great, great future uh, ahead and uh, it's, it's very nice to see uh, all the projects they, they've, they've, they, they did here and they are doing here in this state of Orisha. Um, I think if, if you continue like that, only good things will, will come ahead. India, being one of the world's fastest growing economies, holds significant global prominence. India's participation in a series of summits, including G7 meeting and Commonwealth Summit, exhibits an open-minded foreign policy. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's upcoming visit to Japan, Papua New Guinea, and Australia for G7. India Pacific Islands Cooperation Summit are also a validation of New Delhi's commitment towards issues of global concern. People world over seeking Indian contribution and presence at every decision highlight one indisputable truth, that India is indispensable and cannot be ignored. Moving on. Pakistan politics is in dire straits. It is spiraling downward with each passing day. The arrest of former Prime Minister Imran Khan, his release and fears of his re-arrest have marked a new low in Pakistan's politics. There are also fears that Pakistan might plunge into a civil war. Imran Khan is one of the few prime ministers who have had the gumption to challenge mighty Pakistan military and he says he is ready to take it head on in times ahead. Let's have a look at how the situation has moved forward since the former prime minister's arrest last week. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan is in no mood to give in to the government and the Pak Army's pressure. Khan, whose arrest was declared illegal by the country's Supreme Court, continues to face corruption charges. Khan has denied any wrongdoing and said this week that he would not participate in any investigation by the powerful anti-graft agency. Khan has time and again said that these were the government tactics to keep him away from the national politics, but he was not going to bow down to any force. The National Accountability Bureau, which has in the past investigated, put on trial and jailed all those who have served as Prime Minister since 2008, had earlier summoned Khan for investigation into the graft charges. Khan was arrested on May 9 and later set free on court-ordered bail that was extended to May 31. मुझे पता है आपके ऊपर किस तरह के pressures हैं और जिस तरह आप खड़े हैं तो ना मैं आपको भूलूंगा ना ये काम आपको भूलेगी और मुझे ये भी मैं बाजे कर दूं क्योंकि ये इस तरह का pressure शायद ही कभी किसी की 
पार्टी के लीडर के ऊपर या उसकी पार्टी के मेंबर्स के ऊपर डाला हो जो जो इस वक्त हमारे ऊपर पूरा प्रेशर डाला जा रहा है मैं सिर्फ एक चीज़ वाजह करना चाहता हूँ कि अगर मैं अकेला भी रह गया ना अकेला मैं तब भी हकीकी आज़ादी के लिए इस मुल्क के लिए खड़ा रहूँगा क्योंकि ये कोई गलत फहमी में ना रहे कि इस प्रेशर की वजह से मैं शायद पीछे हट जाऊँगा Khan who enjoys cult popularity in Pakistan has also demanded a judicial commission to probe the violence following his arrest last week. The Pakistan Tehreek-e-Insaf chief said if probe is ordered it will reveal the faces of people who are behind the conspiracy to ban his party. The former premier also alleged that PM Shahbaz Sharif's government does not want elections in Pakistan. यहाँ मैं कहना चाहता हूँ कि ये पूरी साजिश हुई है इन्होंने बड़ी प्लानिंग के तहत किया हमारे पास अब सारी एविडेंस आ गई है हम अदालत में जाने लगे हैं कि जुडिशल कमीशन बनाई जाए तहकीकत की जाए कि एक पार्टी ने इतनी अपनी तवील स्ट्रगल में जब उसने कभी वायलेंस की तरफ गया ही नहीं है तो वो एकदम ये कैसे जाके जला जलाना शुरू हो The arrest of Khan on May 9 by the paramilitary rangers at the Islamabad High Court premises triggered violent protests by his supporters across Pakistan. Pakistan's political drama has gone murkier by day and today it is staring at a civil war. On one side it is Imran Khan and its hundreds of thousands of supporters while on other it is the prime minister and the deep state of Pakistan army which has controlled country's politics for a long time. While the army has brutally muzzled all forms of resistance against it in the past, Imran Khan has posed a serious challenge to both its political legitimacy and authority to control the civil government of the country. Moving on. The possibility of IMF loan for Sri Lanka might just be approaching for the country. An IMF team is in the island nation to evaluate the financial steps taken by the government towards meeting the IMF conditions against the loan it secured the island nation has received 2.9 billion US dollars of bailout money from the global lender after it defaulted on its foreign debt last april the country is in dire need of money in order to emerge from the crisis and IMF is one of the few helping hands including china india and japan that have emerged to save it during the crisis The International Monetary Fund mission in Sri Lanka will assess the effectiveness of the reforms that have been implemented thus far and finish a project to enhance governance in significant economic sectors. As a part of routine meetings in advance of the first review mission later this year, an IMF team is in Colombo through May 23. The team had meetings with a number of representatives including President Ranil Wickremesinghe who also serves as the nation's minister of finance. Commendably, Sri Lanka has already started implementing many of the challenging policy action in these areas. It is now essential to continue the reform momentum under strong ownership by the authorities and the Sri Lankan people more broadly. Economic impact of the reforms on the poor and vulnerable needs to be mitigated with appropriate measures. In an effort to revive its devastated economy, Sri Lanka is working to recover from its biggest financial crisis since independence in 1948. Following its default on its foreign debt in April of last year, the island country has received 2.9 billion dollars in bailout funds from the international lender. The lender will assess whether the government's macroeconomic framework is still adequate. or needs to be revised they'll be here till may 23rd uh, at that point at that point they will be able to uh, provide a more uh, you know comprehensive assessment of the progress with the reform agenda so far in the inaugural meeting of the official bilateral creditors committee which includes india and paris club members earlier this month sri lankan officials made a formal request for debt treatment 
China, the largest bilateral lender to the island, took part in the meeting as an observer. What the IMF does is it provides some financing that cushions the transition from this very harsh reality uh, to a new equilibrium. So it gives a little bit of breathing space to let these reforms that are necessary uh, take place and help the country emerge uh, from, the, uh, from the crisis. So that is really uh, the part that, that uh, helps the population to uh, emerge from the crisis uh, in, in the medium term. By September, the report should be finished and contain recommendations on how to move forward with better governance and less corruption. In order to contribute to a positive cycle that will restore stability, the IMF is also urging local authorities to develop a plan to lower high domestic interest rates. Given the negative global environment and tightening domestic policies, the IMF presently anticipates a 3% contraction of the Sri Lankan GDP in 2023 before recording a moderate rise of 1.5% in 2024. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Thousands of Israelis marched from Ramat Gan to the ultra-Orthodox city of Nebrak this week to protest the government's 2023-2024 budget, which adds hundreds of millions of shekels for the Jewish ultra-Orthodox community. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his coalition of religious and nationalist parties must approve the budget by the end of May to avoid the threat of a new election. Strained by months of unprecedented street protests, Western disapproval and plummeting polls, the government has set $3.8 billion for coalition funds, money to finance political deals with the ultra-Orthodox Jewish and pro-settler parties on which Netanyahu's coalition depends. With 64 of Parliament's 120 seats, Netanyahu's coalition appears on course to vote it through. But around 2,000 people marched in Nebrak to express their disapproval. State support for ultra-Orthodox institution and community, as well as exemptions from military service have long been an irritant to many Israelis. Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Iranian counterpart Ibrahim Raisi this week oversaw via video link the signing of a deal to finance and build an Iranian railway line as part of an embryonic international north-south transport corridor. The Rash Sastara Railway is seen as an important link in the corridor intended to connect India, Iran, Russia, Azerbaijan and other countries via railways and sea, a route that Russia says can rival the Suez Canal as a major global trade route. He also said the 162 kilometers along the Caspian Sea coast would help to connect Russian ports on the Baltic Sea with Iranian ports in the Indian Ocean and the Gulf. Russia and Iran have been pushed to strengthen their political and economic ties by Western economic sanctions on each, which both say are unjustified. Since the 1979 Islamic Revolution that swept US-backed Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi from power, Iran has been ostracized by the West and its economy, crippled by a myriad of sanctions. It holds around a quarter of the Middle East's oil reserves. The West also imposed other set of restrictions over Iran's nuclear program, while Russia was sanctioned due to its actions in Ukraine. Tens of thousands of South Korean nurses went on a strike this Friday after President Yoon suk yeol vetoed a law to improve their pay and working conditions. The bill passed the opposition-led parliament last month, prompting protests from some doctors and nursing assistants who said the new law would open the door for nurses to provide treatment without a medical license. Nurses say their doctor's claim is groundless and that the country needs more care centers to cope with its rapidly aging population. In vetoing the bill, Yoon said that the new law caused excessive conflict among medical workers 
and that nursing practices outside medical institutions would cause public anxiety over the healthcare system. The leader of the progressive Move Forward party that secured a stunning victory in Thailand's election last week said he was confident of building more support and being able to form a stable and balanced government. The challenge for the alliance is winning votes from the 250 member of the upper house senate, a chamber that has appointed a junta after a 2014 coup and has a record of siding with army-backed parties. Pita's alliance was dealt a blow late on Wednesday when Bhumjai Thai, the third place finisher with a projected 70 seats, indicated it would not back any prime minister who supports amending or abolishing the laissez majeste law which Move Forward campaigned on. Moving on. Renowned for its diversity that varies with region, state, community, religion and culture, food in India represents a perfect blend of these varieties. The food in India has also been influenced by various civilizations which have contributed to its overall development and present form. Accounting flavors, texture and aroma, Indian street foods can be boasted as the best in the world. Momos, rolls, gulgappe and chaats are street snacks which will bust your tongue with flavours. One such snack is aloo tikki, which is a potato-based dish. This dish is a comforter for North Indians. Another mouth-watering dish is jalebis, which are deep-fried, orange-coloured, crisp and round worlds dipped in sugar syrup and served with rubbery, a milk-condensed dish. This is so crisp and so different. Now, let us move to Shimla, a beautiful city in Himachal Pradesh, where people have come up with food fusions. Pizza paratha is a dish that combines modern ingredients with earthly spices and is cooked the Indian way. This Chinese paratha I have been making for 3-4 years. It is made of base, it is made of meat, 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 momos, and noodles. It is made of meat, 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 it is made of meat. The local street food has attracted tourists and filled them with satisfaction after eating the dishes. Indian dishes that are influenced by other cuisines always have an Indian touch. India is perhaps the only country in the world which is home to such a vast variety of cuisines. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.